It's now my honor to introduce our next speaker, renowned neuroscientist, anesthesiologist, and statistician, Professor Emery Brown. Please join the stage. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, four ways we can improve anesthesia care for the elderly patient. And the idea is to try to think through the population is aging, as we all realize. It's been a while since I got my AARP card, so I, I'm not talking about someone else. I'm talking about me, too. So the um, so I want to talk uh, talk by beginning to explain to you what general anesthesia is, and we'll talk about ways to improve it. So what is general anesthesia? So it's this drug-induced state that's reversible, and you have analgesia where you're controlling pain, you're unconscious, you don't form memories, you're not moving around, it's easier for the surgeons to operate if you're not moving around, and uh, you keep control of the physiological systems. Uh, that reversible is important because otherwise those conditions are synonymous with death. Okay, and on that list of things that's not cool, that's right up there, you know, near the top, all right? So it's often said how anesthesia works is a mystery, but nothing could be further from the truth. I'm going to give you a little quick tutorial just to show you what, what really occurs. But, but general anesthesia in the elderly patient, let me just go through a few factoids for you. By the time people are 70, they're going to have at least one operation. And 40 to 60 percent of elderly patients will have some sort of brain dysfunction after general anesthesia. It could be anything from just a little bit of delirium to actually having word finding that could last for several months. And poor pain control, nausea, and vomiting are common symptoms after anesthesia. And we take them as just the given, like sort of just the price of doing business. That really shouldn't be. And believe it or not, anesthesia is still practiced quite empirically. It's not practiced from a neuroscience perspective. In fact, the um, the uh, most commonly used anesthetic are still ethers. Ether was discovered in 1846, and, a, it, and we're still using ether. Cefluorine, isofluorine, and desfluorine are the most commonly used anesthetics, and they're all ethers. So what kind of things can we do to improve anesthesia care for older patients? So the first is intelligent monitoring, neuroscience-based monitoring. So what do I mean by this? So the way that the anesthesia works is the drugs produce oscillations, and these oscillations impair the ability of the various parts of the brain to communicate. So let me just show you this in this little sort of cartoon we've put together here. So if this is the EEG of a person who's conscious, you can see it has a very low amplitude, it's high frequency. All right? And so if you're thinking about two important parts of the brain, the frontal cortex, where you're doing a lot of your reasoning, the thalamus, which is an area of the brain responsible for it's like a way station. A lot of information goes to the thalamus, like sensory information, pain information, visual information, auditory information. So this is what it would look like probably when they're communicating, sort of normally, just information going back and forth. And at a frequency range, which is in about 40 hertz or so, the gamma range, or beta, maybe a little bit lower, about 25 hertz or so. But then when you administer an anesthetic, the EEG starts to look like this. So you have lower frequency oscillations in the alpha range, about 10 cycles per second, and even lower, about 0.1 to 1 cycle per second. And the communication between the brain regions becomes like this. So, so this is what the drugs are doing. And so this is just one illustration for one type of drug, the GABAergic drugs like propofol or what have you. This is what they're doing. So you can imagine if the neurons need their clock, let's say, to be at this sort of frequency, and the clock speed is slowed down like this, being able to communicate between different parts of the brain is going to be difficult. The first thing you should realize is this is not natural. This is not a So when you finish anesthesia and thinking, well, your brain's just going to pop back and be the way it was, that's not going to happen. So, and you can imagine as you get older, the ability to sort of pop back is going to be harder and harder to do. And just to show you just sort of some basic sort of physiology, we could look at the, the, the drugs like this and their effects on the brain. And you can see they look a little bit different. But if you look at them in the, in the frequency domain, look at the spectral content, you can see it's much easier to de discern the characteristics of the different drugs. Like the top one on the left, there's propofol. That's a classic signature of propofol, a 10 hertz signal with a, a 10 hertz component 
along with a low frequency component. A young, healthy person coming for anesthesia, receiving an infusion of propofol, that's what's going to look like. Sevoflurane is one of the ethers. Ketamine, and ketamine in particular, this is low dose ketamine. This is the dose of ketamine. You've probably heard that ketamine is being used now to, to treat depression. And so when you give someone that the dose in this range, which is about 35 milligrams, about a half milligram per kilogram, for someone who weighs about 70 kilograms, their EEG looks like that. And that's the state that they're in when they're hallucinating. They hallucinate usually typically when they get these sort of doses. And if you gave them a larger dose of ketamine, the dynamic would change, would change even more, be fast and then slow, inter interspersed with it. And then there you see the slow oscillation of dexmedetomidine. But the, the key thing is the different drugs produce different oscillations based on the targets that they're hitting in the brain and how they alter the circuit dynamics between those, those various targets. So given these, we can sort of take these oscillations and trace them back to the parts of the brain where the drugs are acting and come with mechanistic understanding of what's going on. So the different drugs have different signatures based on their mechanism of action. And those signatures are easy to see in the EEG. And if I go back here, if I were to go back one slide, when we look at the, those patterns again, they're not enhanced. They look exactly like that in the, in, the, in the operating room. And in fact, just one small factoid, this is the strongest EEG signal there is of all the things the EEG is used for. It's, you know, if you think about it, it used to study sleep, used to study cognitive processing. And if you compare it with this, this, this signal is much stronger because when the person is under anesthesia, there's no movement artifact. So you're getting a very pure brain signal. The ironic thing about that is we as anesthesiologists have the strongest EEG signal around, but we don't use it. Most anesthesia is not given monitoring the brain. You have to monitor everything else, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen delivery, oxygen saturation, but you don't have to monitor the brain. It's not required. And one final thing, it changes dramatically with age. So if you look at the person there who's 30 years old, that's like the pattern I was showing you before. This is all people receiving propofol and it does where they're unconscious for, for surgery. Then the gentleman who's in the lower left there, who is um, 57, you can see he has the same sort of pattern, but the oscillation is getting weaker. And look at the woman who's 81. So this is a woman I took care of a few years back. She was having uh, surgery to remove a, uh, a mass on her chest that was the size of a, an American football. And it took the thoracic surgeons the better part of uh, six hours to remove it. And because I was using the EEG watching her brain states, I could give her one third of the already age adjusted doses and have her wake up on a dime at the end of the case because I could see she was quite unconscious there with, from the, looking at the EEG. And as you see, it's not only the fact that she has alpha and slow oscillations, which are quite weak, but you see all the higher frequency oscillations are basically gone, so there's no question that she's unconscious. So it's very easy to overdose older patients because of this. And the, the one part which is a little interesting is if you look at the two gentlemen on the lower on the lower the lower panel, the lower left and the middle, one the, the gentleman on the left looks like the, the thirty year old thirty year old patient and the fifty six year old gentleman looks like the woman who's eighty one. And so what's going on here? Well we age different physically, our brains age differently as well. And so what's interesting is you might be able to see it under anesthesia. And the way to think about this is forget about anesthesia for the purpose of doing of having someone in a state so you can perform surgery on them. Think about this as a neuroscience experiment. You put in a stimulus and you stimulate the brain and it makes the brain oscillate. The brain is nice and healthy, it oscillates like this. And as it gets to be sort of older and older, it's harder to do that. And this doesn't have to do with any, you don't have to invoke notions of dementia or anything like that. Remember this woman who's 81, her neurons have been around for 81 years. So if you think of just a single neuron, the myelin sheath breaks down, the dendrites don't extend and retract as much. You don't release as much neurotransmitter. The, uh, the cell volume declines. The mitochondria don't work as well. So it's, it's less able to propagate those electrical potentials across along the axons and through the cell bodies. So it makes sense that, you, that the EEG would look weaker, or the signal would look weaker as you got older. And the kids, I mean, the patterns are just amazing. Like that's a three-year-old, it's a 14-year-old. And actually the power is actually the strongest between six to eight years of age. It's a, that's just an empirical observation. I, there's no sort of theoretical reason for that. But it looks just like this in the operating room. So one of the things that baffled anesthesiologists for a number of years was they built these automatic indices which read the EEG in real time. 
and they gave you back the number between zero and 100, and you were told to keep, it in a, keep the EEG in a certain range, keep the, keep the index in a certain range, and as long as it was in that range, the person would be anesthetized. It didn't matter what drug you were using. And they couldn't understand why this wouldn't work in kids. But as soon as you look at the spectrum, you can actually see. So if you're basing things on the, the alpha range, like between 10 to 15 hertz, let's say in an adult, and you, and you see that the power above that is actually diminished, well, in the kid, that's where most of their power is actually sitting. So I mean, it, it's, I mean this sounds incredible, but this is, this is what was happening because this was like sort of like a blind AI algorithm that was created about you know, 30 years ago without ever looking at the data or understanding neurophysiology. Now it's really apparent you know, why such, something like this would be the case. So we're actually working to try to teach anesthesiologists how to use the EEG to better take care, better care of their patients. And no surprise, if you understand the structure of the oscillations sufficiently well, you should be able to build a, build a system that could actually in real time read and tell you how unconscious someone is. It's actually much more meaningful. And we've certainly done that. This is just one illustration, elementary example of that that we published last year. So that's the first thing. So use the EEG to monitor the brain. And the second thing is use neuroscience to actually decide how you're going to give your anesthetics. So this is work which I've done with my colleague, Marus Naranjo, who's a very talented um, anesthesiologist in, uh, in Merida, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And she noticed something a few years ago among her patients. A lot of the people there are of Mayan descent. And she noticed that when she would use opioids with them, she had like an, an extremely high prevalence of nausea and vomiting, sometimes many as 40, 50% of the people. And she conjectured there was probably some sort of genetic component to this. So that moved her to try to just define ways to give pain control for surgery. During surgery, it didn't involve using opioids, or at least you reduced the amount of opioid you use. So we started talking about this, and we came up with a strategy for doing this formally. So just to say the obvious, you need, an you need anesthesia because surgery hurts. So what you should do is use multiple drugs to control the state of, uh, state of analgesia, antinociception, not just a single drug. And by doing that, there's a, very, there's a very important side effect that occurs. Those drugs induce, they, they help induce unconsciousness too. So what that means is the amount of drug you have to give to make the person unconscious is reduced dramatically. And it's much easier to wake them up at the end of the case and they have better pain control postoperatively. So I'll just give you an illustration of this with one, one, one case. So this is a woman who I took care of a few years back. She's 89 plus plus. So HIPAA doesn't allow you to say the age of someone who's over 89. Let's just say she was well over 89, all right? And so she has a little bit of diabetes. She has a, she's having a colectomy. And she's about five feet. She weighs about 60 kilograms. So under pain control, I picked three drugs. And just take it my word for it that they control different pathways, pain pathways in the body. And then to, because of that, I only had to give her 30 mics per kilo per minute of propofol to keep her unconscious. I mean, this is really a homeopathic dose. I mean, for most of the people in here, that would sort of barely make you nod to give you some idea. And then we used muscle relaxants there, and she got oral Tylenol and IV hydromorphone at the end of the case. And so this is her EEG. So her vital signs are perfectly stable during the case. Her EEG is, as you get older, Remember how you don't have those large, you don't have the alpha oscillation, you just have slow oscillation. That's exactly what we saw the whole time. And again, at the end of the case, we're able to wake her up on a dime as well. So, so what are we doing here? So this is the idea. Think first about the drugs that you want to use to control nociception or pain. So in that upper left-hand category there, like here with the, uh, right here. So you pick a set of drugs from here, like I pick three. They have an important secondary effect here, which is they reduce the amount of arousal. So that means you can give the person less propofol to keep them unconscious. So you, you achieve the same state with a different combination of drugs. And it's a much more desirable state, I would argue. So what's the third thing? Well, if you have an idea of what the neurophysiology of the drugs is like, and you know when per a person's in a given state, when they, you see a certain signature, you should be able to build a control loop a controller to actually maintain the state of the patient under anesthesia. So this would be great for the operating room as well as for the intensive care unit. Because if we train it correctly, 
a computer could watch the brain better than than uh, than essentially we can. So um, we'd done this a few years ago for using a rodent model, and the FDA said, you know, that's really great, but you have to do it in, in, in a large animal model. So now, recently, we've just done this with with uh, collaboration with Earl Miller, my colleague at, in, in, the BC, in BCS, and Sirish Chakravarti, this is one of my postdocs. We built a system to do closed-loop control of anesthetic state for non-human primates. And you can imagine something like this. We talked about the operating room, but it's probably even more needed in the, in the intensive care unit, where Patients are on drugs not just for a few hours, maybe for several days, and controlling unconsciousness is an important is an important issue. So there's nothing fancy about this design here whatsoever. This is just a standard sort of control system design, which you have essentially the animal we're monitoring at the EEG, and we have what we call a marker of, un of unconsciousness, and it just turns out to be the power of the 20, 30 hertz band. So you, you track that marker. So what you do is. You set the marker at a level where you'd like it to be. You measure where the marker is. You take the difference. That changes the infusion rate of the pump for the propofol going into the animal. And you, it has a duty cycle of every 20 seconds. So let me just show you what this looks like. So just to orient you first. Um, so up here, you're going to see the marker, which should be set at 1 all right, to start off. This is the infusion rate of the pump. Now we start off, we're going to keep it constant, just like we did in the operating room. It's going to be totally constant. And then down here is going to be the air, and you see the spectrum down here. So we're going to start off running the pump constant for about 30 minutes. And the reason we do that, just to sort of show you what the effect on the marker is like when the situation we're in in the operating room every day. So if you want to play that for me. But watch here. So there's the marker. It's moving all over the place because the infusion rate is constant. It's not being controlled. And now right here, the, the controller is going to kick in. So the controller kicks in here. So it brings the marker up to one and holds it there. No surprise. And now we're going to change the level again. And these are minutes on the axis. So that's the amount of time it's elapsing. So we've been there for 70 minutes now. So we drop it down to a slightly lower level. So the lower level means the, an the person the animal is deeper under anesthesia. And now just to move it up, we'll move it up above one, so it's a little bit less deep state of anesthesia, moving it up here. So if you look at this, one thing I want to point out to you, which is really practical. So this part of the experiment here emulates what happens in the, in the operating room. We keep drug infusions constant for several minutes, hours. Look what happens. See, there's no control. The person, the animal is like sort of lightening up. And all of a sudden, it starts getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And what did the controller do? The controller shut down for three minutes when it took over so it could put, put, the, put, the, put the animal back on track. And did the same thing over here. It shut down for about eight minutes where to put the animal on track. That's something you would never, you know, no one is able to actually do something like that in the operating room. So we think that, or, or in the ICU, because the nurse is very busy and has to take care of you know, more than one patient. And certainly not going to be sitting there changing the, the dose every, every, uh, every 20 seconds. And this is just to, I thought I had another slide, actually, but it's not here. But anyway, so, so that's the idea there. So we've tested this out in, in non-human primates now. We hopefully, after a few more, after a few more tests, we can, apply to the FDA to sort of test it out in humans. Because at the moment, there's no closed loop system approved for anesthesia care in humans. So the final thing is turn the brain back on. So this is my colleague, Ken Salt, who's been doing these experiments. So if you could play the video for me. So that's a rat that's anesthetized with propofol. He's got a, a, an IV going into his tail vein. And it's keeping him quite unconscious. He's been there for a while. So Ken has a, a stimulating electrode in his ventral tegmental area. He's going to stimulate his ventral tegmental area. And he's not going to turn the, the propofol off. The stimulation is off. And now watch right here. We turn the stimulation on. It turns it on. The animal starts breathing like crazy. He's activated his brainstem quite profoundly, stimulating in the ventral tegmental area. 
The anesthesia is still going on. So whatever happened is like counteracting the anesthesia. And he gets up and says, look, Ken, I'm out of here. All right. So what, what just happened? So what Ken is doing is, so he's stimulating this, this nucleus here in the top of the brain stem, the ventral tegmental area. It, it's a pathway that goes, starts there, that goes from the, the brain stem up to the, up to the cortex here, and it releases dopamine. It goes through the limbic system here. We usually think about this pathway for reward, but it's important for cognition as well. And when people self-administer Ritalin, for like their SATs or for their work because it's really stressful, they're actually taking advantage of this pathway. So our thought is, well, why not use this pathway clinically to help bring people's brains back after anesthesia? Now, we wouldn't do it by stimulating. We'd actually do it by administering Ritalin, which actually activates this pathway by blocking the uptake of dopamine. And so Ken has done this sort of optogenetically, electrically, and also by administering Ritalin. And so these four things we could do we could monitor intelligently. We could use multimodal anesthesia and neuroscience to choose our drug, our drug systems, build closed loop systems, and wake the brain up. And this is just with current technologies. How can we improve things with current technologies? There's a lot more which can be done sort of moving forward. That's one of the things which we're going to be working on now with this new center, which I've just been setting up, called the Brain Arousal State Control Innovation Center. And thinking about arousal from a neuroscience perspective, and all the various things which could have impact on it. And using ideas from coma, like for example, the Ritalin idea, we're actually using testing at Mass General in the neuro ICU to see if we can help enhance recovery from coma. And so all of these things are actually related. Ketamine is being used to, to uh, treat patients with depression and also some of the other anesthetics as well. So all these problems fall in this, uh, this one heading. And so these are my colleagues with which I'm doing this work, both at Mass MIT and MGH. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Um, obviously, you can use electrical signals to stimulate the brain to reach that. That's a good question. That's a much harder problem to do, to solve this way. Uh, it had been done back in the uh, back in the late '60s. Actually, there's an article in Science about this. They basically just applied electrical currents. It looked like a Frankensteinian experiment: electrical currents across the brain to to actually do that. Um, but that last one of the last points I had there was site-specific anesthesia. I think what we can do is we can find maybe just one or two, like two or three sites that we can control and generate the state so you wouldn't have to inactivate the whole central nervous system. I think that's, that's more feasible. Because we're going to have this, as you, as you get everything, you're going to have the same sort of side effects things that, we, that we're seeing now with the, with the drugs, basically. Is there a way to uh, acknowledge or uh, take advantage of this understanding of the like, oscillation uh, involving the stethia and oscillation of the brain uh, at home for, for an individual, whether it's, you know, with, uh, they, you know, how, how the you know, lifestyle changes or maintenance or with application of pharmaceuticals and you know, the drugs, is there a way that, what's my uh, you know, everyday interaction with this? Now that's a good question. So um, the closest that, that I, the thing that I've come to that I've been involved in is with my colleague Li Wei Sai in uh, Brain and Cognitive Sciences who's been using the idea of 40 hertz stimulation to try to, as a possible therapy for Alzheimer's disease. Therapy and also to try to ameliorate symptoms. So the idea is a uh, straightforward thing to do. You have light and also sound being applied at 40 hertz for about an hour or so daily as a way to, to, uh, to treat Alzheimer's. And she first showed this a few years ago in rodents that this was effective. And now they have ongoing clinical trials in, uh, in, in, in humans testing it out. So, you know, it, it looks promising. So taking advantage of the oscillations that way. Does, it, does your, in that case, is the body you know, kind of artificially speeding up for minutes just to make that external stimulation? You know, if you're kind of pacing it? Or 
seemingly. In other words, so the, the, it's acknowledging that it's, it's making, we're making a very specific assumption that the 40 hertz is like the time clock for the brain. And maybe helping to reestablish that time clock, that duty cycle of 40, 40 cycles per second is, 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 will be better. Now, why it should produce all the biochemical change, and that's, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother discussion. But maybe reestablishing that, that time clock is, is very, is, is, a, is a start, a useful start. Oh yeah, so one of the biggest things that you see is, I showed you the pictures of the different age groups. So the other thing which really changes the EEG pattern that we see in patients in the operating room is how sick you are, how, how sick you are. So if you have a patient that has like, actually COVID patients are a perfect example, where they have a lot of inflammation. Inflammation sort of touch, shuts off the brain's arousal centers and just gives you these very large slow oscillations. And it's, it's interesting, we just, I have a, a case study which we're writing up now, a young gentleman who had COVID, and he was in, the, he was in our ICU for a better part of a month. And he had his x-rays where his x-rays were um, sort of getting better over time. We also had his EEG, and his EEG was just slow oscillations. And once his COVID resolved, his alpha oscillation came back, like you're supposed to see in a young person. So, the, the, the sick brain is, uh, produces a very specific response to the anesthetics that is pretty straightforward to follow. Other questions? Great. Well, thank you.